Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back to Schrodinger Institute. It's always great here and uh, we have great workshops. So uh, the work I'm going to talk about is mostly based on our work with Mikhail Markov who is in the auditorium and some earlier stuff by myself, but I also should mention some much earlier and uh, very relevant for this development things, uh, part of which were done in collaboration with Xavier Bicar, who is also here, Alexei Kotov, who is not, and Glenn Barnish, who is supposed to come to come directly in, in a week or so. Okay, uh, so what is the background of this? of this direction. So first of all, I have to apologize that it's not a genuine flat space holography talk. It's a talk about mathematical methods to understand in a more or less rigorous and geometrical way what happens between a bulk and boundary when gauge, uh, gauge symmetry is present. And uh, the background here is that indeed we are often, uh, we often encounter uh, gauge theories and manifolds with boundaries or more general situations like corners or defects or low dimensional strata and we need to handle them properly. At the same time we know that once it gets to gauge theories a proper setup for gauge theories is the one of uh, one or another version of battalion Milkovsky formalism and because I am mostly talking about uh, locality is very important for me like geometry, so there is a version of this formalism which takes care of locality. Uh, there are various approaches to extend uh, this, uh, this setup to manifolds with boundaries. For instance, probably the most well-known one is by uh, Alberto Catania and collaborators. And there is an alternative one, which is uh, mostly the one I, I'm, I'm going to talk about. It's based on ATSZ uh, AKZ stands for Alexander Stansevi short in the Baromsky uh, so-called AKZ version of DV, which was, uh, strictly speaking, developed in the context of topological, of topological gauge field theories. And the main object for me, which is like a merge of AKZ DV in non-topological setup, is the so-called gauge PD, which is a geometrical object, which somehow can be thought of as a uh, generalization of ATSZ, which properly takes into account locality and uh, which is applicable beyond the, beyond the, the setup of topological models. And this notion Well, I think in recent works, really recent, they start to, 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 to get these things in their approach. But the original setup was very formal. It was not even manifestly. Well, you see, it was not manifestly local, so it's, it was mostly algebraic setup. I'm not sure, in the original version, I'm not sure they were, there was a room for for proper boundary conditions, though they can always say it was because it was a question what you infinite dimensional manifold of field configuration is. I'll try, I'll try. Okay, let's, let's first get there and then maybe we can. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. I think I'll give some comments. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. But um, my understanding is that uh, before, if you want to study, for instance, null infinity, what, what you do first, you first take your theory, for instance, in Minkowski, and then you do this Penrose trick. So you map it to the interior of a manifold with boundary in a proper way. And only then you really get a setup of a gauge theory with boundary where you can apply the, the standard. So this is important part, 
which also in this approach requires a slight re equivalent, reform, equivalent in the interior reformulation. But uh, uh, at formal level, uh, once this com 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 compactification is done, uh, you do not see big difference formally. Of course, once it gets to concrete computations and concrete boundary, there is a huge difference. Okay. Uh, so uh, the aim of this talk, to summarize, I'll try to develop this, let's say, graded geometrical approach to gauge series, local gauge series, with boundaries and to their symmetries. And mostly I'm stuck with a non-Lagrangian setup, though if I have time, I can give some comments about what, uh, how Lagrangian structure looks like, what are charges, and uh, like that. So here is a list of uh, important sources and ideas beyond uh, the ones which I mentioned, which are kind of taken into account or used in this approach. Okay, so let's start with something very simple. So what is a boundary data if we have a, if we have a gauge theory? And let's start with a gauge theory in, general, in just one dimension, so mechanics. So our space-time manifold is, uh, Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So that's a, that's a general question. So suppose our, 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 our space-time manifold, and locally this is always so, can be represented as a, uh, another manifold sigma times the, times the real line with, with the boundary at zero. So that sigma is a boundary of X. So the question, the general question I am going to ask is what are geometrical physical da data which are induced on sigma by a local gauge theory on X? <coughs> and what is the first principle and invariant approach to extract this data? In principle, the same applies to more general situations where you can have, for instance, boundary or just a manifold. Uh, so let's start with a toy model, and to a toy model is <laughs> one dimensional system, so sigma is just a point in this case, and the situation where we don't have any gauge symmetry specified, it doesn't mean that there, these equations do not have gauge symmetry, they could, uh, but uh, they are not specified. So it is known that in a rather, under rather general assumptions, we can represent <coughs> dynamics in a first order form, so I denote by by T, the only space time, actually time coordinate in this case. And uh, so the equations can be written as a generic first order system of ordinary differential equations. And in this case, everything is simple. If we take uh, this T variable, think of it as time, to a particular value, we get just this manifold with coordinates psi A, which is a phase space of our system. So points of this space are initial data. Strictly speaking, we also get a vector field VA, which is defined on this space and which represents the, our evolution. It's, for instance, it's a Poisson bracket with Hamiltonian in this case, it's possible. Hamiltonian. But I don't pay much attention to this V because for the systems we are interested in, the anyway representation invariance, invariance so somehow evolution is, is trivial. In Okay, let's go a bit to some, something more, more sophisticated. So suppose that now we have a partial differential system of partial differential equations. Again, on uh, sigma times, uh, uh, times the rate. And again, we do not specify any gauge symmetry as an additional data. It can be that equations have gauge symmetries, but we don't care. And uh, to understand what to do in this case, it's of course a well-known story. It's convenient to think of this partial differential equation in a geometrical term. According to geometrical definition of PDE, it's a fiber bundle over space-time X. So I denote by X space-time coordinates and by psi fiber coordinates, so field in some sense. And uh, this manifold is equipped with a flat, uh, flat Riemann connection. In the context of PDE, it is known under the name of Cartan distribution. And this data is enough to define, uh, to define <coughs> what are solutions of our system. So in, uh, 
we, do, we can make sure that indeed we, we encode, we encode uh, genuine PD inside this geometrical data. And solutions are simply covariantly constant sections of this bundle, covariantly constant with respect to this connection form gamma, which is like one form with values in vector in vertical vector fields of bundle. Uh, this is a well-known definition of Vinogradov, and in fact, it's closely related to what is known under the name of unfolded formula formulation developed Years theory. And in this case, again, the extraction of boundary data is straightforward because it's, it's a bundle, so we can just pull it back to sigma. In fact, it's not so important if sigma is a boundary or just a some manifold and what is the dimension of sigma. We can always pull back our bundle or restrict it to, to the points of sigma, and the connection is also restricted. So you get a new, new PD. So the message is if, if we are given with a partial differential equation, take any submanifold in the in the space time and pull it back, pull, pull back the bundle there, you get a new partial differential equation. It can be quite sick, but it is what it is. And it describes uh, the boundary data. Uh, from the point of view of uh, solutions, it means, uh, roughly speaking, solutions of this boundary PDE is something like possible initial data for a PDE in the bulk. Yeah, exactly. For instance, if you take if you take Maxwell theory, uh, this this boundary PD, if you rephrase it in normal terms, is going just to encode the Gaussian. Uh, okay, but now uh, let, let's go to something more interesting. We need to extend these ideas to the case of gauge systems, and precisely for this, a useful a useful geometrical uh, notion is the notion of this gauge PD, which I mentioned in the introduction. And let's start with the toy model where our space time is just a point. It's not very interesting uh, as, a, as, a, as a gauge system in zero dimension, but for instance, such a system could arise as a boundary data for, for instance, one dimensional gauge system, which is already physical, so it's still instructive and probably useful to study it. So uh, first, the geometrical definition, we need a notion of so-called Q-manifold, or alternative name is differential graded manifold. It's a, ma it's a Z-graded manifold, which is equi equipped with a degree one, an important vector field, denoted by Q. And the degree is denoted following the transition in, uh, in, in BRST quantization, is denoted by GOS. Gauss number of Q is one. And the standard example of uh, Q-manifold, which everybody knows, is a shifted tangent bundle over, over any real manifold X. In this case, thetas are degree one and they're commuting variables, which are roughly speaking dx of the basis differential forms, and functions on this M are just differential forms on X. So it's a, another way of rephrasing what, what algebra of differential forms is, it's useful sometimes to think of it as an algebra of functions on a graded manifold. And uh, gauge PD is essentially just a Q bundle in zero dimension, but usually there is a uh, additional restriction to, to be able to give a physical and geometrical meaning to it is it should be in a certain sense, I'll describe what equivalence is, it should be equivalent to a non-negatively graded one. Otherwise, there are issues of how to interpret such an object. But uh, this is just a geometrical object, but we are interested in what is physical interpretation of this object. So we need to say what are solutions, what are like physical, <laughs> physical objects here, and what are gauge symmetries. And solutions, uh, by definition, are zero locus, so such a point where Q vanish. And, uh, and uh, then we can introduce gauge parameters. By definition, gauge parameters are vector fields which are on, on this manifold M, which are of degree minus one. And because if we commute such a vector field of degree minus one with Q, which has degree one, we get something <coughs> in degree zero. And this is already an infinitesimal transformation which can, which can move points. For instance, solution with zero locus of Q or such a vector fields, they take solutions to solutions. This is easy to check. 
Uh, another important concept uh, which makes this object quite tricky is that in fact these uh, these gauge PDEs they are uh, they they have a natural notion of equivalence kind of quasi isomorphism and this we very well know in physics because we know that gauge theory can always be extended for instance by adding pure gauge degrees of freedom or, or something like this uh, without changing the physical content so how can it be formalized in this setup, the idea is very simple. If our if our Q manifold happen to be a product of another Q manifold and what's called contractible Q manifold, such that the total Q structure is a Q structure on N plus uh, the RAM differential, in which case is like contractible part space plus shifted tangent bundle over V, and in coordinates it means that total Q has the form of Qn plus such a term which looks like the RAM differential, then somehow the intuition tells us that these variables are contractible. They, and anyway, they do not contribute to homology and they can be eliminated. This picture can be make, made more geometrical by, and can also can be done global, but I don't have time to talk about this. And it's useful to think of this as fixing certain coordinate functions W such that W and QW are still independent, and then this surface gives you a submanifold in a Q manifold, and this gives a simple picture for what's called homotopy transfer. This is a tricky thing, which often is uh, if if you see something equivalent, but uh, the things look completely different. The general rule is you need to look for a homotopy transfer which relates this. So some apparently different things usually are related by homotopy transfer. An interesting story, but in physics it, it was not known for a long time under the name of generalized auxiliary fields or even just contractible <coughs> pairs in the context of local heuristic homology. Okay, now we get to field theory. So now we want the concept of uh, of this gauge PDE in the field theory setup. So what we need is a bundle, just like PDE is a bundle, but now it's a Q bundle. So the total space is equipped with a uh, with the homological vector field, and the source space, the base, our space time is X, but for this bundle, the, the, the source space is a shifted, shifted X, like a tangent bundle over X. So somehow we are talking about in the base, we have all differential forms. So all our fields are going to be all differential forms. And the additional condition is that this Q should be compatible with projections in the sense that Q should project to the RAM differential. In coordinates, it means that Q has the, Q has the following structure. It's a base space, the RAM differential, plus something vertical. But this vertical can depend on, on uh, space-time coordinates as well. And again, this is just a bundle. But an interesting uh, part of the definition is what are solutions and what are gauge symmetries. And solutions now are so-called Q sections, so sections compatible to this Q. Which, which can be compactly written uh, in terms of a pullback by a section. And I also wrote it in coordinates, which again shows us that we have some kind of covariant constancy equation. But the trick is also that there are constraints. For instance, if the degree is negative, the left-hand side is the left-hand side is missing. So we had just the respective constraints which create this zero. We incorporate constraints naturally. And gauge parameters are vector fields, vertical vector fields of this form, again of degree minus one, and they generate gauge symmetries, and it's easy to check that indeed solutions are preserved by, by gauge symmetries. So we, can, uh, we, we have a geometrical characterization of gauge symmetries, and in a similar way, one defines, if any, gauge for gauge symmetry. X mu is an is space type coordinate, yes. Uh, theta is roughly speaking dx, but I treat it as basis differential forms, but I treat them as Grassman node coordinate theta mu. So this is the RAM, theta d over dx. Mm -hmm. Fiber coordinates, yes, exactly. Fiber coordinates. So a section is 
uh, is determined by this psi a of x theta coordinate components of a section and uh, these are equations of motion in terms of in terms of components but uh, in abstract terms it's just the condition that sigma star is a morphism of complexity Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a bundle over graded manifold. So in principle, and that's the very interesting part of the story, in principle, you can have change of coordinates compatible with the bundle where your fiber coordinates transform through theta. So like a mixture between ghosts in the degree one, for instance, coordinates in the fiber and differential forms from the base. There are no two different degrees. There is only one degree. And this allows for many tricky flexible things okay uh the notion of equivalence for this uh, for gauge uh, for q manifolds extends to to this uh, gauge pdes and again i only give just a coordinate version so suppose that in our fiber there is a split between coordinates so there are some phi w and v such that Q of W is V, and the submanifold E tweedle, subbundle E tweedle, is just singled out by W equals zero and V equals zero. So it means in particular that Q is tangent to this subbundle. So we get a new gauge PD, which is called equivalent reduction. And modular subtleties of global geometry, which I don't speak about, locally it's, it's, it's an equivalence transformation. Now it is indeed closely related to what is because now we are talking about gauge field theory, it is indeed closely related to the notion of generalized auxiliary field. Okay, so let's get to some examples of this object. So the first example we already met, but under a different name, it's a PD. So suppose we are given with a PD, which is just a bundle over, over X, then we can just add theta coordinates to extend it to a bundle mm -hmm. over T1X. And uh, of course, thetas are just DXs. And we have a connection, so we can think of this covariant differential as a vector field acting on this graded manifold E. So it's just a covariant differential acting on, different, on horizontal form. Equation, it squares to zero thanks to the flatness of the section. So we have all conditions for the Q bundle, and it's easy to check that we, if we check what what uh, solutions are, this will give exactly the same definition as the standard definition of solution of PDE. But in this case, there are no gauge transformations in, in, in this story because all variables psi i, the fiber coordinates, they are of degree zero because we haven't introduced any ghosts, nothing. That's why the vertical vector field of degree minus one can't exist. So we don't have gauge parameters, we don't have gauge symmetry. Again, it does not mean that the underlying, underlying system doesn't have gauge symmetry. It just means that this Q, which we wrote here, does not take the symmetries into account as it usually does in the case of uh, this type of DV formalism. Okay, and another example which has already takes us closer to, to gravity is Riemannian geometry or how physicists would call it of shell uh, of shell gravity. So to, of course, there are many different ways to formulate it, but the naive one, the natural one, is to start with a bundle whose sections are metrix and uh, gauge par vector field, parameters of the infinitesimal diffeomorphism. But for parameters of infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, we shift their sections of a tangent bundle, but we shift the degree by one so that sections are ghost variables associated to this parameter. In coordinates, it means that in addition to base space coordinates x and theta, <coughs> we have metric and all its derivatives, as well as we have uh, these components of a vector field representing the diffeomorphism parameter and all its derivatives. Uh, and the Q structure is introduced as follows. It must start with uh, the ramp differential, and then there is a vertical path, gamma, which acts on metric, just like Lie derivative. The third index of metric is just an index of derivative, and it acts on psi again by Lie derivative of a vector. It is just a commutator of this 
we call the psi uh, Grassmann odd, and of course this gamma is extended to the entire jet bundle by prolongation, so that it commutes with total derivative. Uh, if one want, one can check actually that if you study, it, it's not a trivial statement to check that uh, to check that indeed if you can see the equations of motion of this system and gauge symmetries, you will find that it is equivalent indeed to an off-shell system whose the only field is metric, there are no equations of motion imposed on it, and the gauge transformation is just a lead derivative. Uh, but it requires some work or the knowledge of some statement. And anyway, it's a good starting point to think about to think about offshore gravity. And the general concept, which is uh, in this sort of applications, is that sometimes it's a good idea to think about geometry as a gauge theory. Because gauge theory has a data of equations of motion and gauge transformations. And usually, when we speak, for instance, about Riemannian geometry, we speak about, uh, about uh, Equations of motion are empty, we just have a metric. But uh, what we need to specify is how metric behaves under the transformations, under the diffeomorphism. So in some sense, and we are going to see that it works, we can replace vaguely, it's, it's, it's not a precise statement, but sometimes at physic, from physics perspective, we can think of geometry <coughs> as, a, as a gauge theory. And it turns out to be a useful concept. Uh, in the same language, for instance, we can go to Einstein geometry by restricting this, uh, this jet bundle to a sub-bundle singled out <coughs> by the prolongation of Einstein equations. So if we take Einstein equations, where under R we understand, of course, Riemannian tensor formed out of metric and their derivatives as coordinates on jet bundle. So we have a surface and Q is tangent to it. So this gauge PD is already going to be uh, equivalent to Einstein gravity. Uh, then we can illustrate the concept of equivalence of gauge PD on the example which is going to be important for the boundary story, so which uh, one can call conformal uh, of shell of gravity. So for this, in addition to what we had, let us introduce a new field, omega, which is required to be positive. And additional gauge transformation for which the ghost is lambda. So lambda is of degree is of degree one. And then one can extend the gauge transformation to include while transformations of the metric. So in addition to usual lead derivative, usual diffeomorphisms, we add additional term such that metric is uh, multiplied by a non-vanishing factor, but this is of course an infinitesimal version. But there is this auxiliary Stuckelberg field for which uh, the gauge transformation with lambda parameter is also just a sheet. So for instance, it's easy to see that this gauge PD is equivalent to the initial one because if we, cons if we consider omega minus one and, uh, the, and the derivatives of lambda and lambda and the derivatives and derivatives of omega minus one, they're going to be contractible pairs for BRC differential. In terms of geometry of physics, this means that we impose a gauge where omega equals to one and hence all its derivatives are zero. So we completely get rid of this omega and lambda piece and we get back to this, what is in black, just to uh, off-shell off -shell GR. And uh, for instance, uh, another illustration or which is also needed of the equivalence of this gauge PD is how one can get a uh, frame-like or, or, or which is also known under the name of Cartan description of gravity. For this, uh, one can observe that actually derivati uh, uh, derivatives of Christoffel symbols and uh, derivatives of ghosts uh, and the metric itself, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, they form a contractible pair for, 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 for Q, for Q vector field. So they can be eliminated, leaving us with just uh, ghost field, anti-symmetric part of first derivatives of ghost field, Riemann tensor, and certain components of covariant derivatives of the Riemann tensor. Again, in this language, they are just certain coordinates on this, on this gauge PDE. And the Q structure after this reduction, after this elimination, looks like this. 
uh, this is already a useful reformulation, for instance, to study Riemannian invariance, because we can now use this kind of algebraic facts to, 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 to find what are possible Lagrangians, which must be uh, the invariant. Uh, and then let's look in this, uh, it's called minimal model because we eliminate it as much as possible. Let's look for what equations of motion and gauge symmetries look like. And uh, according to the definition, these are equations of motion and it's easy to, uh, to understand that these are precisely the Cartan structure equations. So what happens? We, we, had a, we started with a metric-like formulation of Riemannian geometry, we represented it as a gauge PD, and then we performed an equivalent reduction, some kind of maximal one, and we arrived at Cartan, uh, Cartan description of Riemannian geometry. And one can also uh, one can also do the same if Einstein equations are imposed to end up with kind of frame-like formulation of Einstein theory. Uh, Okay, so I, I, I hope I illustrated this concept of gauge PD. And now uh, the important, the extremely important uh, fact for us is that these gauge PD, they behave very well with respect to restrictions to submanifolds and boundaries in particular. So suppose that in our space time, we have a submanifold B, can be boundary, this is matter strictly speaking. Then uh, it's a standard fact that T1B is also naturally a submanifold of T1X. Actually, the, the pullback map of embedding is just a restriction of differential forms from X to B, which is canonical, so it's a canonical. If you prefer to work in coordinates, you split coordinates into a one transversal to B and one the coordinates on B. And then if, uh, if B is single out by X not equal zero, then T1B is equal is single out by X not and theta not equal zero. In particular, the Durham differential, which you can see as a, as a vector field, is just tangent to this surface. This is a well-known fact that Durham differential survives pullback in this case, well with respect to pullback. No, 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 I'm, it's nothing but the fact that uh, the RAM on a big manifold restricts to the RAM on a submanifold. It's a kind of... No, 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 no. Okay, uh, so then suppose we are going with a gauge PD defined on our X, and then we can simply pull it back to uh, the T1B, which is the submanifold of T1X, just as a pullback of bundle. So you can see the fiber doesn't change, we just consider our bundle at points of our, our submanifold. And indeed, again, it is easy to see that Q is tangent to this I star E considered as a submanifold. So we again get a gauge PD. So the picture, geometrical picture, is exactly the same like we had for usual PDs where we can pull it back to whatever, to whatever submanifold we like. And uh, so we, we, we get a new new gauge PD, this E star E, Q I keep denoting by the same letter because it's just a restriction of the same Q, can, which, which is canonical. And this new gauge theory, which we, which we constructed on B, now describes kind of gauge theory of boundary values of, of the field, which were described by initial, initial, initial gauge PD. So the logic is exactly the same like with, uh, with PDs, but what is important we went, uh, we, we are able in this language to go to the submanifold without imposing any gauges. So we take a gauge theory because Q, Q differential knows everything, not only about equations of motion, but also about gauge symmetries, etc. So the entire structure is pulled back to the submanifold, resulting in, in a, again, in a gauge theory. Okay. An uh, example of this phenomena uh, in the simplest uh, setup, again, one dimensional, we, we are back to one dimension. Uh, let's take something physical. So take, for instance, uh, the constrained Hamiltonian system. It's easy to, to formulate it as a gauge PD because it is one dimensional. So Q is just a differential of a constrained Hamiltonian system with C Argos and phi Argos momenta. And, uh, Implicitly, there is a symplectic structure from the Hamiltonian vector field generated by 
BRSP charge, BSV BRSP charge. And uh, so the total Q differential is just the RAM plus this small Q. And there are fields associated to ghost, to phase space variables, and to ghost momentum. But these are trivially zero because they're in degree minus one, they don't lead to physical, physical fields. And if you read off equations, you will find familiar equations of motion for a constrained Hamiltonian system. And if you read off uh, gauge transformations, you find uh, you find uh, usual gauge transformations for uh, constrained Hamiltonian, for equations of motion of constrained Hamiltonian system. And if we pull back everything to a boundary, which means just one point in this case in, on timeline, we get, of course, just the BFV phase space of our system. Uh, in this setup, to simplify things, I put Hamiltonian to zero, but we know that for relativistic systems, we don't have to. So for instance, we, 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 we arrived at Hamiltonian formalism as it should be on the, on the uh, thresholds of the initial data. Okay, and now we come to the point of uh, boundary conditions, because this is a very important story in, in, studying, in studying boundary. Because uh, when, when I was doing this, for instance, I imposed no conditions. They were on, I, I just induced, induced the I star E gauge PD on the boundary without imposing any constraints on it. So it's like free, free boundary data. So what we need, we need to be able to impose in the same setup to impose some boundary conditions, which means that we need to specify in this geometrical language. This means that we need to specify certain submanifold, sub sub GPD of the boundary PD I star E, which is which describes the additional restrictions we impose on our fields, but not only on fields because coordinates on the fiber are now fields, ghosts, etc. So in a one shot, you impose you impose boundary conditions on your fields, your gauge parameters, gauge for gauge parameters, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, here, of course, this, this EB should be such that Q is tangent to it. This means compatibility of boundary conditions with gauge symmetry. So that Q, so this EB, okay, this is abstract setup. In each case, realistic, of course, you need to decide what your EB is. But the consistency condition, what you require of it, is that Q is tangent. So your gauge transform, you, you, you restrict your fields and gauge parameters, roughly speaking, in such a way that your gauge transformation with restricted parameters preserve your field equations with restricted fields on the bound. Yes. Um, yeah, 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 you can, but yeah, realistically you are right. You impose something, something on fields and you go with Q on it and you get uh, minimal, uh, minimal additional conditions you need to impose in order to have it consistent. But uh, I also need to warn you that of, although this language looks simple, uh, uh, it's also tricky because everything is defined up to equivalence. For instance, you can think that you impose non-trivial boundary conditions, but this can be just an equivalent reduction. It means that you like gauge fix a lot without changing the physics, and it's not a genuine genuine uh, matrix. Okay, and uh, now I'm ready to give a formal definition of what is GPD with boundary. So it's, uh, it's just a sum of uh, GPD on a manifold with boundary plus this GPD of boundary conditions, EB, which we just, just discussed. But there is a certain modification, completely natural, there is nothing deep here. Uh, uh, there is a natural modification of a concept of solution and of gauge transformation. The solution, of course, should become a solution of the boundary, of the boundary condition of the boundary. And gauge parameter should also be compatible with the boundary. So it should be tangent to this boundary, boundary equation. And then, indeed, you can check that the same formula gives you gauge transformations, which preserve solution with uh, boundary conditions taken taken into account. 
And uh, uh, then we can describe not gauge, but general symmetry. Uh, the usual story is, of course, that uh, symmetries are vertical vector fields which commute with, uh, with the total differential Q. In particular, there are gauge symmetries which have the form of a commutator with Q, which automatically satisfy this, and they form an idea in all symmetry. And if you are given with such a vector field, you can you know how to transform your field configuration. Your your section is just that, and that's what it looks like in terms of length. This is a standard, more or less standard setup. And uh, one can check that under some general assumption, this is, of course, it's not a usual definition of symmetry, but you can check that if you really build it properly, starting from the formulation, it's a correct definition of symmetry. And if uh, we are dealing with a theory with boundaries, then of course your symmetry should be also compatible with your boundary conditions. It means that this vector vector field W should be tangent to the uh, to the D of boundary conditions, this is E D. And uh, now we we can uh, give a, a proposal for how asymptotic symmetries can be defined in this setup. Of course, again, there is nothing new. We know that asymptotic <coughs> symmetries is something like uh, gauge symmetries, which become non-gauge because uh, because of because of boundary conditions. So here it's exactly the same. So we can say that W is an asymptotic symmetry if it arises from a from a gauge theory. So it has uh, from a gauge symmetry. So it has this form, but the gauge parameter this Y is not, well, it can be tangent, but then it is just a gauge sym symmetry of a, of, a, of a theory with boundary. But if it is not tangent, then it gives you, in general, a genuine, uh, genuine asymptotic symmetry. So these are gauge symmetries which become non-gauge in the presence of boundary, and uh, this is a geometrical definition of it. Uh, in principle, there can be competing definitions. For instance, if we want to Usually in the Lagrangian of Hamiltonian setup, we call asymptotic symmetries. Th those gauge sym would be gauge symmetries which have non-vanishing charges. All I can say is that uh, this definition is compatible with that. If on top of this game, we have a symplectic structure which allows us to construct charges out of, out of symmetries. Okay, in particular, uh, if we don't have uh, if we don't have non-trivial boundary conditions, we don't have non-trivial asymptotic symmetry. They remain just gauge symmetries. Um, okay, I, well, time is running, but I hope I will be able to say a few words about, this is exactly the point which was asked in the beginning. Uh, what, what do we do if you're interested in gravity with asymptotic boundary? Because what I was talking about before applied to manifolds with normal boundaries just to, to theories on manifolds with boundaries, but for instance, if you're interested in gravity uh, in asymptotically flat or asymptotically ADS, we only have asymptotic boundaries. So the first step is we first need to make asymptotic boundary into a real boundary, and this geometrically, this was explained by Penrose, and the idea is to map our space-time into the interior of the, of the manifold with boundary, uh, such that if we allow for a conformal transformation of a metric, the transformed metric is well defined, is well defined on the boundary. So we mm -hmm. Pardon? Yeah, 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 yeah. For this application, we have to do it, but uh, somehow uh, in, in my next step, I will explain how this Penrose approach is realized in uh, terms of uh, gauge, gauge theoretical implementation of it. I, uh, it's, it's a good question, but maybe it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I hope maybe some consideration, because it, it gives a different perspective on same issues, maybe it can be useful. Okay. Um, so, and uh, if, we, if we think about our, our, our theory as a theory uh, with boundary, then our space-time X and metric G is just a particular solution of our gauge theory on a manifold with boundary. And in the interior, it is equivalent to 
to what we started with, not with, with the bound. Uh, and the trick, of course, to implement it still theoretically is, was already was already discussed. We add uh, this Schuttelberg field omega, but in the interior it is required to be uh, greater than zero. But on the boundary, uh, we set it to zero. This is just to implement to implement this Penrose description of uh, conformal conformal in infinity in field theoretical terms. So we can, uh, speaking in terms of the GPD, we consider this conformal like gravity, gravity ex extended with these additional things. We know that if omega is greater than zero, then this theory is equivalent to just gravity. So it means it is equivalent to gravity in the interior. But if we add boundary where omega vanishes, it is strictly speaking not. And we constructed a gauge theory with boundary in the sense of the uh, discussion above. Uh, then we, uh, the conformal geometers, uh, taught us how to implement uh, how to implement Einstein equations in this setup because we are really interested in cell gravity geometry. And uh, the trick is that once you have a conformal invariance, you can easily write down the what's called almost Einstein equations, which implies uh, Einstein a conformal Einstein equation. So. The, the, DA is total derivative, total derivative, just because I'm using this just, uh, just derivative, think of just derivative. Yeah, yeah you see gamma over here, Christopher was saying. If you, if you want usual language, this is just partial derivative. Forget about capital D, but because you see here there are prolongations, I have to use this terminology of jets, but that's not so important. Uh, so there's a statement which is known from conformal geometry for a long time that if you impose on, on uh, if you impose on omega on a scalar field such such an equation that vanishing of this gap, uh, then it is equivalent to conformal Einstein equation. If we extend the value of this, then it, it is this Einstein equation with cosmology gamma. So. Uh, more specifically, so if we consider this as equations on both omega and d, then this is uh, is just another way to describe to describe the theory in the, this overcomplete theory. Okay, and now uh, we uh, in, what we are going to induce uh, induce the the, the bound uh, induce uh, from this bulk data we are, we are going to induce boundary data. And uh, for instance, we want to check that indeed uh, the description, our, our, our definition of uh, entropic symmetries reproduce at least known, uh, known results. So the strategy is to uh, pull back uh, everything to the boundary because we already have gauge PD, everything is fine, we know what to do, but it's huge, it's infinite dimensional object. So what we need to do is to simplify it a little bit for instance, by eliminating the maximal amount of contractible of auxiliary, of auxiliary field, generalized auxiliary field. And then, in, if you really want BMS, we need to impose quite a strong, uh, quite a strong boundary conditions and see what, which asymptotic symmetries survive. And for the, in fact, the ingredients of what happened are known in the literature. So for instance, as, as you remember here, in this sector of metal, lambda, <coughs> Uh, and xi, and, and uh, yeah, lambda xi and metric, uh, this, this story is completely equivalent to the description of conformal geometry. It's just this presence of omega fills the vial symmetry and makes it equivalent to a gravity. But for conformal geometry, the minimal model is known. It was computed by La Boulanger. And, uh, if we use this, if if we use this uh, minimal, uh, if if we use this uh, minimal model in combination with some additional steps, then we get to the uh, to the following minimal model. Of course, it's just the beginning of it, because there is also an infinite chain of how Q acts on curvatures. But if we are just interested in BMS, we can safely set this curvatures to zero. But in principle, this is what gravity imposes. Uh, what, what gravity induces on the boundary. 
And uh, this size or all these variables, they can be identified as ghosts for Poincaré algebra. And in fact, these quadratic pieces of P, if we set, if we set curvatures which are in red to zero, then we get just a Chevalier-Lindbergh differential of Poincaré algebra. So we see, uh, we see uh, that kind of frame-like formulation of the induced theory of boundary values in terms of Cartan geometry. So we have a connection of Poincaré algebra with the tricky structure of curvature. If we set curvature to zero, we just get a flat connection of Poincaré algebra, but this is, of course, not a general setup. And in this, uh, in this setup, one can check that one indeed recovers BMS symmetries. To recover BMS symmetries, we need to put frame, which corresponds to this ghost size uh, lambda to zero. And together with uh, associated, that's exactly what Daniel was asking. If you put some field to something and then you act on Q on this condition, you get a consistent boundary condition because now Q is tangent to the to the entire submanifold. And by doing some algebra, you consider, you, you show that your gauge parameter which survives may look like this, and is essentially parameterized by BMS field, so you recover BMS symmetries on the boundary. There is one, I only hope I, I mean, that there is one step more which you can do. It's a bit of a work in progress, so it's a bit clumsy. So it's, uh, if you, on top of, if on top of gravity, you have a matter field, and for instance, we are given to some matter phi coupled to gravity in a diffeomorphism invariant way, which means that in this language of two, two, <laughs> of, uh, two bundles, that uh, the differential of gravity <coughs> acts on phi uh, in the following way. So these diffeomorphisms and some additional terms if phi is a tensor field, then we can uplift this equation to a pseudo conformally invariant equation by introducing this scale omega to make it to make it both diffeomorphism and while invariant and uh, then uh, one needs a bit more uh, a bit more trick to get rid of negative powers of omega in the, in the equation just by multiplying by omega which is an equivalence transformation in, in the interior where omega is positive and then you are ready to pull this back pull back this equation to a boundary to obtain uh, the equation which is uh, invariant uh, in the sense of uh, induced geometry. For instance, if we do it for, if we do it for exotically ADS space and consider our gravity solution as a background, then we end up with conformally, conformally invariant equation, conformally invariant in the sense of conformal geometry, so diffeomorphism invariant and weil invariant, where metric is rescaled by weil factor and field is rescaled by, by certain factor which is here. Uh, the field. Oh, yeah, that's exactly, exactly this example. If, for instance, we take, if we take uh, asymptotically ADS setup, so negative cosmological constant, and take the following weight, we, of course, recover conformally coupled scalar. And uh, it's, uh, of course, not surprising because this procedure amounts to a kind of covariant and gauge, uh, compatible with gauge invariance procedure of uh, Peckerman Graham, who, uh, who taught us how to extract conformal invariance out of Riemannian invariance in the bulk. So this is just a gauge PD implementation of this procedure. And in fact, technically it also works. I don't have much to say about, I don't have much to say about Herolian case, unfortunately, but uh, with Xavier Bicard, we played this game in the linear setup, but for higher spin gauge fields in, in the setup of ADS CFT. And indeed this procedure gives a simplified version of this approach, gives quite a handy tool to, to recover gauge invariant conformal equations on the boundary. And this is probably quite a good way to, to describe some conformal <coughs> fields. Uh, this also works for, this also works for Herolian setup, where lambda is zero, but uh, this I would refrain from detailed comments because it's 
uh, it's work in progress, but what is interesting that in, in principle, the, the, think, uh, the, the approach teaches us how to extract, uh, to extract relevant invariant equation on the boundary from diffeomorphism, generic diffeomorphism invariant equations in the bulk. But of course, something interesting happens only for special values of uh, W8, which is, a, which is an ingredient which you put by hand. So you put it and then you study for which values of W, you get something interesting. This is precisely like in the question. So I arrive to my conclusions. So uh, one can think of all this. Uh, you, especially if you put on top of this symplectic structure, you can think of this as a geometrical and uh, BRST invariant, uh, BRST type extended version of covariant phase space approach. Uh, it's, uh, it definitely works to study asymptotic symmetries and uh, boundary dynamics. Uh, from the point of view of uh, Lagrangian Hamiltonian formalism, you should probably think of this. Again, you need symplectic structure to, to really take care of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian structures. This can be considered as a version of covariant Hamiltonian framework of the Donder and Weil, which in turn can be covariant phase phase. This also gives a kind of first principle derivation of the uh, conformal geometric structure calculus approach uh, uh, recently studied by Yannick Hesray. And uh, in turn, uh, it's also probably related, this I don't understand well enough, to the setup of Gover and Waldron for formal boundary calculus. And uh, so this also gives the field theoretical realization of Hefferman Graham construction and probably gives the Carolian version of Graham uh, useful in the studies of higher spin, but um, of course, the real motivation for which I don't have much to say by now is the uh, high spin, uh, high spin holography in the Carolian setup, because uh, this technique uh, have proved useful in the context of usual high, usual high spin holography in the PSTC setup, where unfortunately the the bulk theory is uh, seem, this Vasiliev theory seems to be non-local, and that's why applications are quite limited because you face this non-locality by doing by doing this trick. But uh, one of the hopes is that maybe in asymptotically flat in Carolian setup, it can be more uh, this is future. And I don't know. thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking long.